Are we back again? I uh, hope you're well. Uh, students, we are going to carry on, as I said, with now lecture 14, which is the content and message of Thessalonians, the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians. But um, I'm actually just going to focus on 1 Thessalonians, the content of 1 Thessalonians today. And then, Lord willing, next week we will continue with finishing that off. But before we go further, I want to read 1 Thessalonians 4 from verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4 from verse 13. This is one of the key contributions of the, the book of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, the eschatology that we find. So let's read from 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13. But we do not want you to be un uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as, as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. There's the comfort. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Such wonderful, up, stirring up words of the Lord. But Paul continues. Chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake. And be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Put, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, again, he says, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. So, <clears throat> this first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul, as we saw, addresses a young congregation, which he had, he had had to leave because of the pressing dangers of Jewish persecution. And knowing that he couldn't go back to the city, he decided to write to them, especially because he had received news about how the congregation were doing in their circumstances. So let's go into the overview of 1 Thessalonians. Um, the content of 1 Thessalonians centers around seven, several prayers. Now, this is an amazing uh, sort of unique aspect of 1 Thessalonians is that it has these prayers that provide structure to the whole letter. So each of these prayers basically uh, provides a, a conclusion to one section and an introduction to the next section. So that's like a bridge between sections in the letter. And in these prayers, there are four key words. Faith, love, hope, and holy, or holiness. And those are the main themes of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Now in 1 Thessalonians, as we've seen 
in Ephesians, as we've seen in Colossians, there are two main sections. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, it's the first section that is primarily practical, and the section, second section that is primarily doctrinal. Um, so Paul in, in 1 Thessalonians 1, chapters um, 1 Thessalonians uh, 1 to 3, um, Paul focuses on the practical and he recounts his time in Thessalonica and the return of Timothy and his main discussion centers around faith, love and hope. Then in chapters 4 and 5, that's mainly doctrinal, but that doesn't mean there's nothing practical there. Um, and it includes the prayer, or, or sorry, the concluding prayer in chapter 3 is what introduces the topic of the holy life, which becomes the main theme of chapters 4 and 5. So the life of faith of the believer while waiting for the return of Christ. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 to 13 to get an idea of that prayer that is uh, not only the the hinge between the previous section and the following section, but between the two main sections, the, the practical and the doc doctrinal sections of 1 Thessalonians. So, chapter 3, verses 11 to 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before the, our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. So that's the bridge between the two main sections. Um, if you go over the page in your notes, there is the, um, the chart there that shows the structure. And um, we've just read those key verses in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. Um, notice that the first three chapters, the more practical chapters, also are more about the past. So it's recounting the past. Whereas the more doctrinal section, chapters 4 and 5, is looking more to the future. So there's the past and the future in 1 Thessalonians. Now, if you look there at the structure, look how... Amazing it is how those, there's one, two, three, four prayers. Um, three of them are in the first section. So one right at the beginning of the letter, one in, in chapter two, and one as we saw at the end of chapter three, which is the hinge really into chapter four. And then the last prayer is right at the end of the letter. So um, uh, just get that picture in your minds for the structure of 1 Thessalonians. So let's go through the content in more detail. So recounting the past is the first main section, the practical section. And there's the opening prayer in, in verses 1 to 3. So, well, firstly, there's the, the naming of the, the, the authors of the letter and who the recipients are. Um, but the prayer is in verses 2 and 3. Let's have a look at that. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 2 and 3, uh, it says this, we, thank, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So those are key words already in the first opening lines of the themes that are going to run through there's work of faith labor of love and steadfastness of hope those three key words then in chapter 1 from verse 4 all the way to chapter 12 of, of uh, chap verse 12 of chapter 2 is the historical overview uh, we won't read all that there's a lot there but um, there are two main points to be made here one is that um, it's about how the believers of Thessalonica came to faith in Christ. It's describing their conversion, their experience um, of becoming believers, and responding to the gospel, hearing the gospel and responding to the gospel. 
seeing the the the, uh, the power of the gospel um, in the and it mentions there um, in verse five in the power in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction that's how they received the gospel and as they received the gospel they turned away from worshiping idols to serve the true and living God. So from this faith also flows the hope of the return of Christ, even mentioned in verse 10 there of chapter 1. So how the believers came to faith in Christ is the first part of the historical overview. And then the second part is the ministry of Paul and, and Silas and Timothy in Thessalonica. And Paul recalls what it was like. And, and he talks about that it was not in vain um, because they had to declare the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict and they and yet experiencing this conflict didn't move them to use flattery in order to, to kind of please their audience and, 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 and win their way. Um, nor was proclamation of the gospel a tool for their own glory. Um, rather, they had an attitude of caring parents. Paul even calls him, compares himself to a mother nursing uh, in caring for the believers in Thessalonica. Um, and also, they just sought not to be a burden to the church by working night and day. So Paul definitely presents himself and, and Timothy and Silas as examples of ministry for, to the Thessalonians. And they were not people who came with their own agenda um, to, to somehow gain for themselves, but rather to give of themselves for the sake of the, of the gospel and the sake of the church in Thessalonica, these new believers. So they gave an example of how a Christian should live in both their word and their actions. Then uh, comes the, the second prayer in chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. Um, we did read that um, in, in the first part, um, but let me just repeat it, at least some of it here, from verse 13. And we also thank God const constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ that are in Judea. Uh, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, and so on. But you notice there that uh, one of the key things to note to, that about these, these Thessalonian believers was, was that they received the word of God. They didn't only hear it, they accepted it. And not as the word of men, but as the word of God. Um, that is uh, got to happen if people are going to become true believers. They mustn't be following the words of men, but the word of God and recognizing the authority of the word of God. So as a result of their faith, these believers not only saw how Paul and Silas and Timothy were persecuted, but they themselves have come to be persecuted and experienced persecution, which um, they must now endure as well as Paul. Um, and in this prayer, Paul connects back to the idea of persecution that was already seen at the beginning of, of chapter 2. So um, persecution uh, of the church is one of the reasons why Paul is concerned for the church and uh, why he wants to write this letter to them, to try and comfort them and encourage them. And that concern is also um, what comes to the next section Chapter 2, 17, verse, up to chapter 3, verse 10, is about Paul's concerns for the church. So, um, Paul, Silas, and Timothy are longing to see the believers again, but that can't happen. He talks about having been hindered by Satan from coming to them. So, the, basically, there's, he's recognizing the work of the devil in stirring up persecution and opposition to them. So, uh, Timothy was sent back to the city to establish and exhort in the faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. You see, uh, his, his concern is that affliction will cause him to move away from the faith, to deny the faith, 
to, to rather um, find a safe option. But no, he sends Timothy back to establish and exhort them in the faith. And also to learn about their faith, for, to find out how they really are doing. So now Timothy has returned from them and he had told Paul and Silas about the believers' faith and their love in chapter 3 verse 6. So that was a consolation, a comfort to Paul to realize that even though there is this persecution that the believers are experiencing, they continue in faith and in love. And that helps Paul to become more sure and more strong in his own ministry. Um, and yet Paul says, we still long to come and see you. Uh, he would love to come and visit. Um, and that leads to that third prayer, which we already read, the one that's the hinge between the two main sections. Um, and what are the three things that we see in that prayer? Firstly, Paul prays that God may direct our way to you to make it possible for them to visit uh, the believers in Thessalonica. And so Paul constantly shows them that he longs to be with them again, longs to, to fellowship with them again, longs to have an opportunity to teach and establish them further in the faith. So he's praying for that. Secondly, that the Lord may make, may make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all. Okay? Not only praying that believers may love one another more, but everybody, even outsiders, even unbelievers, even those who would be persecuting them, should be loved by them. And thirdly, um, that they may be blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus so here's that new theme that's introduced. Holiness and expectation of the return of Christ and hope in the return of Christ. So that leads to the, the, the last, the main section of holiness. A holy life and the, and the return of Christ and the resurrection um, and the life of love and holiness. So we come to the second main section which is looking to the future the doctrinal section, which we read um, a large part of it. But the first part that we didn't read is chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, on living a holy life for God. So um, the question there is, how should a Christian live while anticipating the return of Christ? Do we stop everything and just pray? Or do we carry on? with work and ministry and life. Um, so there's three applications. The first application is that a Christian should live a sanctified life, a holy life, um, abstaining from sexual immorality, chapter 4, verse 3. And that means that marriage should be treasured and not tarnished, uh, as with the heathen society around them. So live a holy life as you expect Jesus' return, as you anticipate Jesus' return. Secondly, uh, a Christian is to live a life of love toward others, especially their fellow believers. Um, and we, uh, where do we learn about love? We learn it from God. He's the one who teaches us to love one another. Um, and Paul is able to say, which indeed is what you are doing, but he urges them to do it even more. So live a life of holiness, live a life of love, and continue to work. Live an honorable life, a responsible life, diligent life, so that you can take care of your family and, and others and the people in the church. So one of the problems that is also addressed in, this, in the next letter is specifically this issue of, of laziness or people stopping work because they, they just want to wait for the Lord to come. Uh, some had misunderstood Paul's teaching on the imminence of the return of Christ and, and was stopped working. And as a result, they became a burden to the congregation. So that's the holy life before God looking to the return of Christ. Then there's what we read, uh, the first part in chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, the resurrection, which is a doctrine of comfort. It's the motive behind Paul addressing this was to comfort the believers persecution had resulted in the death 
of some of the believers. And that raised the question of, so what happens to them now? Because they've, they've died before Christ returns, so are they okay? And so Paul addresses the issue of the resurrection at the return of Christ to comfort the believers and also to make corrections to what they believe or how they understand things and also to lead them further in their faith um, in this doctrine of the return of Christ and of the resurrection. Um, so the believers are pointed to the resurrection of Christ as the source of their comfort. If Christ is risen, then we have the hope of, of resurrection. That's also in 1 Corinthians 15. And if we don't have, if we don't believe that Christ is risen, then we have all people most to be pitied. So 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So there's the, the comfort. Those who have died are spoken of as having fallen asleep, as something that is not uh, a dead-end death, but a temporary thing. It's falling asleep until Christ returns and wakes them up and um, with him will live forever. Um, and that's also when Christ returns, not only will the dead be raised, but those who are alive will also be with the Lord. Now, looking at this more deeply in the next page in your notes, um, 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is often used to, to justify the idea of two returns of Christ. The idea that Christ will return and then believers that had died will be resurrected and together with the believers living on earth at that time, they will be raptured, caught up into the sky where they will live in heaven for a period of time, maybe a thousand years, before Christ then returns a second time to judge the earth. Well, um, that needs to be corrected. Firstly, nowhere in the whole Bible is uh, a two return of are the, are two returns of Christ taught. Uh, if you look at the book of Revelation and you uh, argue for a ret two returns of Christ, well, you have to be consistent then in how you read Revelation. Um, do you read the whole book of Revelation as a chronological? Um, uh, account of how things will happen one after the other right through the whole book from beginning to end or do you see it as a number of pictures running in parallel of the same events but described in different ways so the second option is the way we should understand uh, the book of revelation so if you want to argue for two rev two returns you actually need if you look at the book of revelation to argue for for Ten returns of Christ, if you're going to take everything in the book of Revelation in chronological order. So there's no real biblical argument for two returns of Christ. Secondly, the issue that Paul is addressing here in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, he is a specific issue. He's dealing with how to comfort those who have lost loved ones who are believers and are wondering what has happened to them. So that's what he's addressing so he's not really addressing the issue of the of the sequence of events when Christ returns what he's primarily saying is that those who have died already will be there and that we will be with them too and we will all be with the Lord um, it's a comfort uh, teaching it's not a putting everything together teaching and then thirdly it also doesn't if you argue for two returns that doesn't take into account the, the, the whole of the Bible's teaching on the return of Christ. It's just reading too much into to one text. All right, so that's uh, the, that section of uh, chapter 4 come to an end. Then chapter 5, which we also read, the first 11 verses are on the return of Christ uh, some more. And that's where the, um, we read about the thief in the night um, passage. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11 is about the return of Christ and it is addressed as a means to ignite the zeal of a holy life, the, the enthusiasm for a holy life. 
So the suddenness and unexpectedness of the return of Christ means that you always need to be ready. Um, you need to be fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And believers are to live their lives each day as children of light. There's no going into the shade, going into the darkness because, well, don't expect Christ to come today. No, every day we should expect Christ and live as if Christ is going to return. Um, we should not become drunk with idleness, but we should stay awake and be sober. We should be putting on the armor of God, um, having the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope, of the hope of salvation. There are those three themes again, faith, love and hope. And when Christ returns, he will come to judge. For the believers, Christ's return will bring eternal life with him. But for unbelievers, it will be judgment. So for this reason, believers should live a holy life now, today, and every day. And then the last commands in the closing prayer in chapter 5, 12 to 22 is the last commands. And then... 23 to 28, the, the final prayer. So the last commands address three issues. Firstly, the believers should acknowledge those who lead them in the faith. There's some uh, great passages here about showing respect for, for those who lead you. And then secondly, they are to show love towards one another, as has been mentioned before. And then thirdly, they are to live a holy life under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's the, the last part of the last commands. Uh, um, acknowledge your, and respect your leaders, uh, love one another, and live a holy life under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So in addressing these issues, Paul connects the whole section under the terms faith, love, and holiness now, and then concludes with his final prayer. And, that, and, and there he prays that God may sanctify them completely on the return of Christ. That is, that the life of holiness that they are living now will become complete by the final destruction of sin and the effects that when Christ returns. Let's actually look at those last couple of verses there. Chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And then he concludes with another uh, greeting and a blessing at the end. So um, that's basically what we find in 1 Thessalonians. We've overviewed it quite quickly. Later on we might uh, look at the theme of the resurrection and the return of Christ in a, a lot more detail. Um, and that will be in the next lecture when we also overview 2 Thessalonians. So this first letter to the Thessalonians shows how our faith and hope in Christ are applied to our daily lives when, when we live in holiness and love. So faith and hope producing holiness and love now in our lives. So you can't be a believer saying that you put your trust in Christ and not be willing to live a life that is according to his will, a life of love and um, holiness. So justification, being declared righteous in God's sight, becomes visible in our sanctification, sanctification in our daily lives. So I hope you've been encouraged by 1 Thessalonians and um, especially the, the, the prayers and the comfort of the return of Christ that we can look forward to. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you indeed for your wonderful word and for the wonderful truths that we think about. And Lord, we do pray that our faith and our hope, our faith in what Christ has done, our hope in his return may cause us to love one another, to love all people, and also to live holy lives, that we'd be zealous for holiness. We wouldn't just kind of add on holiness as a little extra uh, every now and again. But Lord, that would be something we are zealous for so that you would be glorified in our lives. Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our, our returning Lord.
Amen.